Again, I'm Michael, School Programs Coordinator here at the Wild Center, coming to you from the NatCab, or the Naturalist Cabinet, as we call it here at the Wild Center. So behind me are cabinets full of different specimens of organic and inorganic origin. So they're rocks, they're fossils, they're model plants, a microscope, as you can see in the corner there. Um, there are so many different taxidermy and cool things to explore. Uh, today, I've pulled down one of my favorite uh, taxidermies, and we're going to be using that uh, to explore adirondack predators and prey uh, so that it cooperates with me and doesn't run away. Uh, but we'll be taking close looks at a couple animals that you may or may not have seen in your, in your travels, uh, whether you live in the Adirondacks or, or other portions of New York State or around the country. Um, so today we'll be exploring um, two different animals, but before we get to that, I want to make sure that anybody that's joining us on Zoom um, we'll be using the speaker view. So you wanna make sure you're in speaker view so you're seeing me right now. I'm the only screen that's here, uh, but I will be adding a second one for my mobile science screen um, just over next to me. Uh, so we can explore up close with our specimen. And then if you have questions for me in Zoom, you can go on down to the bottom of the screen. There's a Q and A function. Uh, it's two little speech bubbles above a Q and an A. Um, that's question and answer. And you can throw any questions, observations into that as well. And we'll have some time at the end for questions. If you are in Facebook, um, you are just seeing me, uh, so you're along for the ride, and you can write any questions that you have in the chat, and um, we'll be able to check those on throughout the program. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's get going. Uh, so again, we're checking out two different animals today, exploring some really wonderful adaptations of Adirondack predators and wonderful adaptations of Adirondack prey. Um, so that one animal, the predators are able to get food, the prey doesn't want to become food. So we'll be looking at how um, those animals are adapted uh, with two specimens here. So we'll be checking out the, um, the fisher, sometimes called fisher cat. Um, though they are not cats, they're actually more closely related to otters. They're of the weasel family, the muscolid family. Um, and then we'll be also checking out the American red squirrel uh, with another uh, taxidermy specimen. Great, so what I'm going to do now is a little bit of technical wizardry. I'm going to turn on my screen on my other camera, turn off this one uh, so that you can hear me and that uh, you can see what I'll be showing here. So give me just a moment. Let's go ahead and get this camera on. So mobile science is on. Let's go ahead and spotlight the video. And you should now be seeing my specimen over there and the side of my leg. Great. Um, so we are joined by these two different specimens of taxidermy here. Again, the, um, uh, the fisher right here and the American red squirrel right here. Um, I'm using American red squirrel because there are other species of red squirrel in Europe, um, but this is the one that you tend to find here in the Adirondacks. Um, these two animals, uh, one is a little bit more common, one's a little bit more elusive. Uh, but they are both widespread throughout the Adirondacks. Um, and I'm sure if you've gone for a hike or even a walk, um, you've probably heard this one yelling at you. Uh, red squirrels uh, make some high-pitched chirping noises uh, that they use to ward off any um, predators or other animals that they're uncomfortable with coming close to them. We're going to start today with the fisher. And what I'd like you to do is if you're in the chat or in the question and answer function on Zoom, go ahead and throw in any observations that you have. Uh, so we're going to be diving into different, different adaptations, different parts of this fisher's body to really see how this is well adapted uh, to life in the Adirondacks and to hunting prey, not unlike the squirrel here. We'll see if anybody uh, drops anything in. Otherwise, I'll just tell you things I think are interesting. Uh, so here uh, we have, have the fisher. You'll notice it's a, a, a little bit of a larger animal here. Um, males get up to about 13 pounds at their largest, females usually around six or so. Uh, so that difference in size is called sexually dimorphism. Uh, so the, the males are a little bit bigger than the females for this species of animal. Um, and they use that to their benefit and that they, whether male or female, are, are really, really well adapted to being predators. Um, if we look up close at the mouth here, we can see that it has some sharp canine teeth. Uh, those teeth they would use to, to grab its prey. Um, and hold on to it so it doesn't get away. If it was able to capture this squirrel, um, now frozen in time, um, it would be able to hold on to it so that squirrel wouldn't be able to make an escape. Additionally, in addition to these, these teeth here, 
Um, it has strong claws on its feet. And you can see if I can get a little closer with that, with the, the claws there. So if you look at the claws, um, it has large foot pads uh, for holding onto the trees and where it's climbing around. Um, and then these large claws on its front feet and its hind feet. Uh, fishers have a really, really interesting adaptation for their hind feet, their back feet. And then they can actually rotate their ankles. Uh, so if they were to climb up a tree, this fisher's chasing this squirrel up a tree and this squirrel realizes that there's nowhere else to go up the tree, it likely will turn around and try to go back down. It's nice and small, so it can make that rotation quickly and, and go back down. It's got a larger area to work with on the tree. The fisher is a little bit bigger, uh, so there's a little bit less of a surface for its, its body size. Uh, so it may not be able to turn around and do a U-turn as the, the squirrel could do. What the fisher has to help it out is its hind feet um, down here that you just can't really see right now um, are actually able to um, rotate 180 degrees. Uh, so it can go up the tree, turn its feet, and then go back down the tree um, to, to catch food like squirrels. Um, and it's actually worked out to its advantage and then it's learned some adaptive, adaptive behaviors to actually hunt porcupines. Um, so their fishers are intelligent enough um, that they know that the spines on a porcupine are bad news and that they should avoid it. Porcupines also know that and use them to their advantage to protect themselves. Uh, so in some cases, porcupines will walk up to a tree and really stick their head in the, the, the root area so that um, other animals wouldn't be able to get to them. They essentially have their spines or quills sticking out uh, so that animals can't get at them from behind. The fisher knows that if it goes up the tree and turns back down, um, it can kick the porcupine or knock the porcupine from its head onto its back. Um, and then its, its belly portion of the porcupine doesn't have quills and the fisher can, can access it that way and, and be a predator of porcupines based on that, that behavior. Uh, the fisher here has rounded ears, so it's not losing as much heat um, in the cold months in the Adirondacks. Uh, so fishers tend to be found in northern portions of, of the U.S. and southern portions of Canada um, and do really, really well here in the Adirondacks. Uh, one, because their ears aren't losing a lot of heat, as with some other animals. And two, they have very dense fur, very thick fur covering their body, um, which goes all the way down to their tail there. And that fur allows them to stay nice and warm. It essentially acts like that, that's a warm uh, jacket for them uh, throughout uh, all months of the year. They have a nice dark coloration. So this dark fur will help them to blend in uh, with their environment, whether they're in the underbrush or on trees, um, that dark body does really, really well for, for blending into the Adirondack forest and northern forest. The red squirrel also has some of that, that camouflage going on. It has an orangey red uh, back of its body, uh, so it can blend into many trees. And then this one um, that is frozen here jumping, see if I can get this down a little bit. It has a light belly. So the dark back, whoop, there we go. Uh, the dark back and the light belly are an adaptive strategy, a camouflage strategy uh, called counter shading. We see it in aquatic animals a lot. If you look around at any of the fish here at the Wild Center, um, you can see that they have a light belly and a dark back, um, and that helps them blend in from the top and from the bottom. So if something's looking down at the ground above the squirrel, that back blends in with the ground below it. And if something's looking up from the ground into the trees, and maybe the belly of this squirrel's exposed a little bit, um, that belly blends in with the light sky above it. Uh, having that, that the best of both worlds with that counter shaded, so dark for the top, light for the belly, helps it blend in with its surroundings. Uh, fishers, like this one, again being a larger animal, uh, tend to live a little bit longer than, than a red squirrel. Uh, fishers typically live about 10 years or so, or can live up to 10 years in the wild. Uh, red squirrels are closer to about two and a half or so years. I'm going to check to see if anybody has any questions or observations coming in on, on the chat there. Again, remember, if you do have any questions about these animals here, um, go ahead and throw those into um, the Facebook chat or into the question and answer block here on, on Zoom. And I'd be happy to, to talk about the observations that you all are making um, as we explore these two different texts that are here. Um, and again, we're looking at an American fisher and an American red squirrel here, looking at the, the benefits or the adaptive strategies of predators and prey. Uh, so while the fisher has these big claws, 
for grabbing its prey and holding it still, um, and for climbing. Uh, the red squirrel here has smaller claws, not necessarily or not used to grab prey, uh, but used to climb around its environment. And I suppose um, you could say not necessarily to grab prey, but to grab its food. Uh, red squirrels are typically surviving off of seeds and nuts uh, from plants. Uh, so you call them a granivore um, is one, one title for that. And they'd be using their, their, their front uh, paws there to grab onto things like pine cones so they can strip off the protective covering and get to all the seeds within that. Uh, so one telltale sign if you are near where there are squirrels, um, one, if you hear them chirping at you, that's a good indication that you're by a squirrel that doesn't really want you there. And two, if you find little pieces of pine cone, it looks essentially like someone has taken a pine cone and pulled off all the, the little sections protecting the seeds and left just that middle shaft of it. And then all the, the protective, not really petals, the hard woody parts of a pine cone, um, you'll find them on the ground um, based on where squirrels have been eating. I found them on the trails out to wild walk off and on. And, um, and I know I've seen them on the trail um, in various parts around over on my home and or in throughout the Adirondacks as well. Uh, so that's a good sign that you have a squirrel around if you haven't actually seen them. Uh, fishers, uh, we have a question from Tracy on Facebook. Do fishers swim all that well? Um, their name is misleading. So um, while they do have the name fisher, they don't really use water at all for, for their, their food source. Uh, so they tend to stay right on land or climb in trees and tend to not um, seek out animals that live in the water or swim around in the water all that much at all. Uh, their cousin, um, the North American river otter, does spend a lot of time in the water um, and, and would use, uh, use that to find its prey. Uh, so the main meal for fishers would be any, really any small uh, mammal or small organism that they can catch. So things like squirrels, um, they, as I mentioned earlier, have adapted to being able to hunt North American porcupines, um, though they would tend to rely on food sources that are a little easier to find. So they tend to be a carnivore, um, but they are known to eat things like mushrooms and berries and other food that they find around them. Uh, to take a closer look at the, the skull and the jaws of our fisher here um, in the squirrel, I've grabbed a couple skulls that we have here in the naturalist cabinet. Um, that, as a disclaimer, aren't of the actual animal. So this skull here that I'll be, be exploring for the fisher is of a North American river otter. So it's a similar shape, both being uh, musculates. They're going to have similar uh, teeth uh, to, to, as predators or as carnivores. Um, and we can take a look at that up close. And then the skull I have for um, the, the North American red squirrel here is that of a muskrat. So it's a slightly larger uh, more aquatic rodent uh, than our, our red squirrel here is, uh, but still has the similar features of a rodent skull. Uh, so let's check out the, the North American river otter skull. So I'll hold that up over by the camera. Uh, so with, with the skull of a, a weasel or a muscalid, um, they're going to have slightly more elongate skull um, than you think of for our human. Our skulls tend to be vertical. Um, the skulls of, of North American river otters in this case, of fishers and other musculids are going to be more horizontal, more elongate. Um, they have, even on the fisher, this, this bone here is a little bit more pronounced. Uh, so there's this bone that comes off the side of, of the skull and that, based on the distance it, it comes out of, around that, um, that's where a lot of the muscles come through. So the, the bigger this little arch here is, uh, the more muscles can fit under it and can be used for that bite force uh, for, in this case, for the otter, but in, in the case of the fisher, they also have very strong jaws um, where they can use these nice sharp teeth here uh, to, to bite their prey. Uh, the, the otter here, let's see if I can get to the camera, <laughs> uh, has these strong canines. If you move your tongue around in your mouth, I'm sure you can find your canine teeth. So you have got the little incisors in the middle there oh, that I'm blocking with my hand. Uh, we have the little, little incisors in the middle there that, that we use to, to break apart food a little bit. And then our canines, both top and bottom, like the solder and like the fisher, um, are a, a lot smaller, but still could be used to, to grab prey a little bit. Um, with the fisher, if we go in close, we can see the canines here, and then the ones from the top. And that's what they'd be using to grab onto their prey and hold it. And then they have, again, some of those sharper teeth in the back uh, to help them to, to break up that, that food and the, the meat of the animals that they're, they're hunting. 
So I saw we had a couple questions come in. I'm going to check that quick, and then we'll be back to the skull of the squirrel. Okay, great. Uh, so with this squirrel, uh, you can see that this skull here, this muskrat skull, is a little bit bigger uh, than the squirrel here. So this is essentially a, an, um, a zoomed-in view of what you could expect for, for most rodents. Uh, so rodents, like our red squirrel here, have grinding teeth in the back. So that's what they're eating the seeds and nuts with. And then to break into those seeds, to pull off the pieces of pine cone, to break into things like acorns, they have these teeth here. Those are called incisors. Uh, so these incisors, two at the top, two at the bottom, grow throughout the whole life of that squirrel. Um, and they need to file it down. So that's when they're, they're eating um, the various uh, grains and seeds. Um, they can file these teeth down, keep them nice and sharp, and keep them growing. Uh, so that they're able to consume their food pretty effectively. And if we look at them side by side, you can really see how it's a completely different uh, suite of teeth, whether you're looking at a predator or prey, and that usually can be a good indicator for what kind of animal you're looking at. If you were to say find a skull or maybe even just the bottom jaw in the wild, that can tell you a lot about what that animal was eating and a little bit about the life um, style of that animal. We'll put those back down um, and see if we have any more questions coming in. Uh, so I have a couple more things to share with you about these two animals. Otherwise, um, we're going to turn it over to some questions. So again, if you have any questions um, on Facebook, you can write them down. They'll get shared with me here in Zoom. And then if you're in Zoom joining us, you can go ahead and write those questions right in the Q&A uh, section. Great, so another question from Tracy on Facebook. Do fishers live in dens? As far as I know, no. They may use uh, some areas for protection if they're able to find a, a hollow in a tree. Um, they could use that or, or, or a, a, a den created by another animal. They may use that for some protection. Uh, but um, as far as I know, they're a little bit more nomadic. And then a question from Catherine and Keith. Um, are there other types of fishers? Also, as far as I know, um, there aren't other species of fishers, but there are other species of weasels uh, here um, in North America uh, based on other, other animals in the family muscolid, muscolids uh, or weasel family. So you have otters, minks, martens, uh, fishers, and then a couple different species of weasels you'd find throughout North America and throughout New York State. So um, what I'd like to do now is take us back over to um, my camera one. Uh, so I can see all the questions coming in. I'll answer some questions and uh, I'll turn you over so you can have a, a great afternoon of exploration today. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn this on. Thanks for bearing with me as we, we change up the view here. Let's cancel the spotlight there, spotlight this video, and I will be back in just a second. Great. Uh, thank you all for all your questions. If you would like to explore a predator or prey, uh, either in your yard, in your neighborhood, or um, based on videos online um, in your favorite, um, favorite nature documentary or, or YouTube video, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you where to find out some more information. Uh, so I'm gonna hop back a couple pages. So if you go to wildcenter.org backslash digital, you should come to a page that looks a lot like this. Here, it's the landing pad for all our awesome digital content. Uh, whether you want to explore the museum virtually uh, with our virtual visit, you want to check out the lunchtime live videos, we have one coming up in just over half an hour, um, and then one every Monday through Friday uh, will be hosted here in our lunchtime live section and on Facebook. What we are exploring right now is our digital learning. Um, or yeah, digital drop into learning here. So if you go to wildcenter.org backslash digital learning, scroll on down. If you're on Facebook and aren't included in our, our emails, um, you can click here to get, get added to that. So you'll hear what we're doing and what exciting things we have started for the summer. You scroll on down, you can find all of our digital learning content hubs. Each of these has a recorded video. It's got a worksheet and some really cool ways to dive more deeply into an exploration of the topic of the video. Uh, so today, June 9th, 
Um, we're exploring predators and fray uh, with our Fisher taxidermy. And the video that we are essentially just recording now will be here in just a little while. And then at the bottom, uh, there is a challenge. So our predator and prey challenge number two is to take a few minutes to observe a video on YouTube or a nature documentary. Think about some questions that you have and what th observations that you notice about that animal. And then to create a poster, a model, a diagram, or a story about that animal and how it fits into its environment in, and is an effective uh, predator or prey. Uh, so if you're up to the challenge, I challenge you to try it out. Um, and we will turn it over to some questions now. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and check out the Q&A and we'll see what other questions we have and go from there. Okay. I'll give it a couple minutes. If there are any questions on Facebook, I'll see if they can migrate over here. Questions on um, Zoom, you could go ahead and type them into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen there. Otherwise, I wish you happy exploring. Um, it's always fun uh, practicing science and observing. I find I always learn something new and half the fun of science is sharing that with someone um, that may not know that information as well. Uh, so happy exploring. Um, I hope to see you next week for another edition of Digital Drop Into Learning. And then also definitely check out our lunchtime live videos live on Facebook at noon on Mondays through Fridays. Uh, thanks again for joining me this morning. I hope everybody has a great day and we will see you next week. Bye.